stopped up nodes. I don't know why. It's supposed to be the CIA. <laughs> Most of you are sure that people who support US foreign policy, with whom you argued and argued. You point out one horror after another, from the, all the bombings and the invasions and the torture, and, and from, from Vietnam to Iraq, but nothing helps, nothing changes this person's mind. Uh, now why is that? Are these people just stupid? Uh, I think a better answer is, that they have certain basic beliefs, certain uh, basic preconceptions. And if you, if you don't deal with those basic beliefs, you will not get anywhere with them. It's like talking to a stone wall. And what are, the, what, what are these basic beliefs? The most basic of them is a deeply held conviction that no matter what the U.S. government does ab ab abroad, no matter how bad it may look, no matter what horror may result, our government means well. Its intentions are honorable, even noble. And the, the great majority of Americans hold these beliefs very tightly. They, they just believe that we Frances Fitzgerald, in her classic study of education in the U.S., a high school education, wrote in summary, quote, the, the United States has been a kind of self, this is what people believe from their studies in our high school, the United States has been a kind of salvation army to the rest of the world. Throughout history, it, it has done little but dispense benefits to poor, ignorant, and diseased countries. The U.S. always acts in a disinterested fashion, only from the highest of motives. It gave, never took, unquote. And Americans genuinely believe, wonder why the rest of the world can't see us that way. Even people who take part in the anti-war anti movement can hold these beliefs. They, they're marching to bring out that good America that, that they were taught to love, which they still love. They march to bring out this, the, the best in, in this America. And, and that's not, they're not exactly actually opposed to the policies. These Americans are very much like, uh, well, Charlie Brown falling for Lucy's football. Uh, no matter how many times they, they lie to or fool, they continue to believe the standard propaganda of a U.S. foreign policy. They're, these Americans are like the children of a, a mafia boss. They don't know what their father does for a living, and they don't care. They just love him. And, and they want, but they have to wonder why someone just threw a, a bomb through the living room window. This, this basic belief in America's goodness is very sim similar to what we're told about American exceptionalism. Let's just look at how exceptional how our foreign policy has been. Since the end of World War II, the U.S. has, has one, attempted to overthrow more than 50 foreign governments, most of which were democratically elected. <coughs> Two, dropped bombs on the people of more than 30 nations. Three, attempted to assassinate more than 50 foreign leaders. Four, attempted to suppress a, popul a populist or nationalist movement in more than 30 countries. Five, gr 
grossly interfered in uh, the elections of more than 50 nations. And six, led the world in torture. Not only torture performed directly by Americans upon foreigners, but with Americans providing lessons in torture, manuals for torture, and being present to observe their students. All this is indeed exceptional. No other country in all of history or all of the world has come closer to a record of this kind. So we are indeed exceptional. So the next time you're up against a stone, a stone wall and the person uh, ask that person what the U.S. would have to do to lose his support. Ask him what for him would be too much. Keep in mind that our homeland, our precious homeland, above all, seeks to dominate the world for economic reasons, ideological reasons, nationalist reasons, Christian reasons, and for the personal advancement of a whole slew of executives and officials whose careers are based on one war after another. And these people are not necessarily bad people. They're, they're like the sociopath who doesn't care one way or the other, or the other. It's not the behavior of a decent, normal human being, is it? No. Take the Middle East and South Asia. The people in those areas have suffered horribly because of Islamic fundamentalism. What they need desperately is a, a secular government which will honor and respect all religions. But do you know that from, from the, from the mid-1970s 1970s and through the 1990s, there were a number of such secular governments in, in those areas. And what happened to these governments? The U.S. government overthrew the war. First came Afghanistan, uh, which from, from the mid 70s until the, the late 80s had a, a secular government where women had full rights, believe it or not. In, in, the, the women of world wore miniskirts. Imagine that in, in Afghanistan, women in miniskirts. This government was overthrown by the, by the U.S. and which gave rise to the Taliban. So keep that in mind the next time you hear an American official say, we have to remain in Afghanistan for the sake of the women. <laughs> After Afghanistan came Iraq. Another secular society under Saddam Hussein and the U.S. overthrew that government as well. And now the country is run by crazed and fanatical jihadists and any woman not covered outside runs a serious risk. Next came Libya. Again, a secular country, nation under Muammar Gaddafi, who, like Saddam Hussein, had a, a tyrant side to himself, but he also had a, a, believe it or not, a rather benevolent side. Under, under Gaddafi, Libya had the highest standard of living in all of, of Africa, and he also was, was a champion of African rights. He helped to form the African Union, so he was not all totally the bad guy that we're taught now, but he 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 dared to uh, not become a client state of the U.S. and he was over for that. He offered his, his people free free education and free health care too. By the way, uh, in 2011, the U.S. with the help of NATO bombed Libya every day for six months. 
and until the, the whole thing collapsed and Libya then also became a failed state full of crazy hardists. So, and so after Libya came to Syria. For, for, for four years now we've been attempting to overthrow Syria. Another secular government. And, and guess what? Syria is now also a playground of crazed fundamentalists and jihadists. With everyone's new favorite, the Islamic State. To this list we can actually add Yugoslavia, which also was a secular, secular state. And the U.S. overthrew that government, which gave rise to, to a, an independent Kosovo full of crazy jihadists again. So the, the rise of the Islamic State was a great deal of the U.S. foreign policy. With, with the overthrow of all these governments and then what came after them, it, it's no wonder that the Islamic State is running wild in the Middle East. And what, what did all these governments have in common that we overthrew? They all refused to be client states of Washington. They refused to be uh, subservient to the empire. In a word, they wanted to be independent. So what do Americans leaders think of their own record in this context? Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice could have been speaking for, for all of the members of this private club. She spoke about our foreign policy leaders when she wrote in 2000 that in the pursuit of the national security, the U.S. is no, long, no longer needed to be guided by, quote, notions of international law and norms of institutions like the United Nations, because America was on the right side of history, unquote. Condoleezza Rice. Let me remind you of Daniel Ellsberg's comment about the Vietnam War. He said, it wasn't that we were on the wrong side. We were the wrong side. <laughs> so what should we do about the Islamic State, which we can see US foreign policy gave rise to in a major way? We smashed, the, opened the bomb door, and all the animals escaped. And, it, and we can't put them back in. We have to do something to combat ISIS, obviously. But when we fight Syria, well, in Syria, we must keep in mind a few important things. One, we, we, we have to watch for signs that this fighting is taking place not to overthrow ISIS, but to overthrow Assad of Syria. And two, we have to keep in mind the, the civilian casualties of our bombing, what that would be. I think the Islamic State will actually die of its own weight. It's, it's already covered so much territory. It, it can't begin to, to govern that. that I, I, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but it's just the, the huge number of people they need to run this whole the entire Middle East on this. And it will continue to create hatred of itself all, all over the area. Well, okay, I, I'm going to pause now, but uh, we'll talk later. Thank you very much.
appreciate to learn from David Swanson. A lot in what he said that's very important that I will be agreeing with and building on, and you will note some divergence as well, which is a healthy part of why we're here. I'm a correspondent for Revolution newspaper, the voice of the Revolutionary Communist Party, and I'm speaking to our question today from the perspective of the need and the basis for a revolution that will bring about the world without any oppression, without any exploitation of women, of minorities, of people whose society deems different, and so on. But instead of societies where might makes right, which dominate and rule the world today, societies where humanity is consciously and voluntarily transforming itself in the world. If you're not familiar with Revcom.us or Revolution Newspaper, I'll apply the picture worth a thousand words method for a very quick introduction. And you will find posters like these as part of what we produce at Revcom. These get shipped by the hundreds into America's prisons, read by dissident intellectuals around the world, and are part of our contribution to the world revolution. So we'll leave that up for a moment. But now I'll go back to my presentation. Uh, in this light, I'd like to make what I think is a friendly amendment to our topic today. U.S. wars of aggression and Islamic Jihad, which is the greater danger? And I would like to add to humanity. Because I think a, a big part of the problem that William was identifying is that far too many people in this country, and this affects the movements for social change as well, think as Americans. I remember it having a very profound effect on me as a teenager when I heard Malcolm X say, I'm not an American and got sense enough to know it. I'm one of the 20 million African American victims of America. And I said to myself, I need to find out more about this guy. This, he's on to something. Even as at the time, I found that rather provocative. So I think it's an important starting point as we address this question of how to oppose the crimes of our government at a time when it is in conflict with reactionary jihadist forces. I think it's important that we start from the moral standpoint and the fact that American lives are not more important than other people's lives. And I think William made a convincing case that American exceptionalism is essentially what he said, an exceptional record of wars, torture chambers, tyrants, and oppression. Let me take an example uh, that I want to point to. We cannot accept or allow the terms of debate about what the U.S. did to the people of Iraq to be whether or not that was a dumb war or whether or not that war wasn't in the interests of the United States. That isn't what that war was about, and that's not how it should be judged. As William was pointing to, this was not a war to bring the Salvation Army to Iraq or bring any kind of liberation to Iraq. This was a war based on an assessment by at that point, the defining elements of the U.S. ruling class that they had a moment after 9-11 to tear up the whole Middle East and restructure it in a way that would facilitate their global economic and political and military domination. Now, in many ways, that invasion did end up backfiring on them. But that's not why it was wrong. It was wrong because it brought indescribable misery to the people of that region. William was talking about this. You know, in some of the research I've done for articles about Syria, for instance, uh, for coverage at Revcom.us, there are hundreds of thousands of Syrians driven from their homes. That country has been torn up from top to bottom, and the United States bears the responsibility for that. 
This is not a dumb war. This is not a war that we should be judging by whether or not it serves U.S. national interest. This is a war of imperialist aggression and a crime. So what country is the greatest threat to humanity? We're living in. And we have to take responsibility for that. But if we're going to get to a world without oppression of any kind, I think we need to do more than answer that question. I don't accept that exposing the crimes of ISIS or other reactionary regimes and powers that are in conflict with the United States is, has to be in opposition to calling out and exposing the crimes of our government. In fact, I see this as a package, something that we have to do together. Now, there is a challenge to handle the relationship between that correctly. You can say, well, you know, ISIS is really bad. I'm going to spend all my time exposing their crimes. That would be betraying the people of the world, particularly when you're living in this country. But I think to break out of the current vicious cycle in the world, where every U.S. drone, every exposure of U.S. torture, which is not to get information, but to terrorize the people of many, much of the world, these things then give rise to what people see as the only alternative. And we don't have time to go into this, at least in, in this presentation, but if you dial the clock back to when at least William and I were coming up, there was a different kind of oppositional force in the world. There was revolution and communism on the map in the Middle East that was a positive alternative. So that during the Vietnam War, for example, there was a good guy side to root for. And not only was Daniel Ellsberg correct that the enemy was us, but the solution was, and many of us came to identify with and support the Vietnamese revolutionaries, the revolution in China, and so on. Now, since those revolutions were turned around, that alternative has been both physically off the map and ideologically taken a beating. We have been told for decades now that that is not a possibility, that capitalism is the best the world can do. The person who has done the work to dig into that, to scientifically examine that experience, including why it was set back, to chart a way to advance on that, but in an even more emancipatory way, with a stronger basis in international with more appreciation for and promotion for the role of dissent in socialist society, for example, is Bob Avakian. And the reason that those of us who are advocates for his new synthesis of communism are so determined to get his work out there is two reasons. One, the world needs a revolution, and this is a way it can happen. And two, if we don't lift the ceiling on people's expectations, if People's thinking, radical people's thinking, is confined to the lesser of two evils between Russia and the United States or Iran and the United States. That is not only not going to lead anywhere in the long run, it is going to be a stifling and suffocating influence on the level of resistance to the crimes of our government. And I want to very briefly identify for those of you who haven't seen it, I don't know if this is quite readable, but maybe. I don't think it's too much to read on a poster, but I'll read it out loud. This is a quote from Baba Vakian that we refer to as the two outmoded. And what he says is, what he identifies is, what we see in contention here with jihad on the one hand and the world big crusade on the other are two historically outmoded strata among colonized and oppressed humanity up against historically outmoded strata of the imperial system. These two reactionary poles reinforce each other, even while opposing each other. If you side with either of these outmoded, 
you end up strengthening both, and I'm going to return to why I think that is. While this is a very important formulation and is critical to understanding much of the dynamics driving things in the world, in this period, at the same time we do have to be clear about which of these historically outmoded has done the greater damage and poses the greater threat to humanity, it is the historically outmoded ruling strata of the imperialist system, and in particular, the U.S. imperialists. So I've spoken to why I think our government poses the greatest threat to humanity, but is it really the case that if you support or are even soft on either of these forces, you end up strengthening both? Well, there's different dimensions to this. One is clearly the actions that, again, I've got to use the air quotes for our government every time I refer to it. It's clearly the case that every time they go into one of these countries like Yemen, which they're doing now through Saudi Arabia, carrying out mass murder with bombings, supporting the most despotic forces, that people turn to the other alternative on the ground, which unfortunately right now is Islamic jihadist, reactionary Islamic jihadist forces. And it's also the case, and we just need to confront this, that when the forces like ISIS are in control of an area, I don't know if anyone's seen this movie Timbuktu, it just brings us to life in a very visceral way, but you know, they ban music, uh, as well as imposing very draconian rules uh, from Sharia law on women. So what I'm arguing is that if we re restrict our paradigm to only exposing the biggest danger to humanity and not the whole package, we, won't, we will end up even ironically pulling our punches, metaphorically speaking, in terms of our own ruling class. Let me take the example of what's going on now between the United States and Iran and the debates within the respective ruling classes of these reactionary superpower and reactionary regional power over whether and how to develop their relationship in both of their mutual interests. Who and what does it serve to support Obama's moves to develop collaboration between the U.S. Empire and the Islamic Republic of Iran to shore up both of their interests in the Middle East. And by the way, there have been massive protests within Iran against their regime, including large-scale participation of women. Revolutionary communists are in the mix of this. And what I'm posing is, why can't we oppose, and this should be our main task, the crimes of our government while supporting genuine revolutionary resistance and struggle around the world. So I want to conclude by returning to the point that we are living in the country responsible in very direct ways for vicious exploitation and murderous oppression everywhere on earth on a level that no other force on this planet can touch. Not in the same ballpark. We have a moral duty to oppose that, not to democratize it, not to advise it on how to do its work in a more peaceful way, but to oppose it. And that is not opposed to, but there can and should be dynamic synergy between that and wrestling, wrangling, and yes, debating over what will fundamentally get to the root of what's wrong in this world and how to get rid of that. We saw this in the Vietnam era, where we Stayed up all night, went to study groups, had debates between different trends, and then we were all out the next day opposing what our, our government was doing in Vietnam. And today, if you look around the world in this country, from Ferguson to West Baltimore, if you look at the upheaval around the world, there is every basis to bring forward that kind of movement today on an even more profound basis. Again, we will have questions and conversation as soon as our third speaker, David Swanson, is finished. <coughs>
thanks. Wonderful to uh, follow such remarks from two great speakers. Wonderful to be here and to see all of you here. It, this, this idea that, uh, that Bill Bloom keeps uh, pointing out to us is a problem in our society, this, this fantasy that the U.S. government means well. There was actually a poll done at the, in December of 2013 by Gallup in 65 countries asking what is the biggest, what country on earth is the biggest threat to peace in the world? And who won overwhelmingly in almost all of those countries? The U.S., right? So the U.S. means well despite the will of those people. Right? So the Iraqis take polls that in a majority of them want the U.S. to get the hell out of their country. But we have these moral arguments for staying in Iraq for their benefit, right? And to be as careful getting out as we were reckless getting in and so forth. Uh, the, I, was, uh, I was walking up here from Greenwich Village this morning and I passed a restaurant and on the big glass window it said, defending the American table. <laughs> uh, who the hell attacked it, right? And what is American about it? it, it, it this, is, this current war is, is fundamentally and entirely about scary videos of people having their heads cut off. Right? Now, if anyone this week lost a job in Nebraska executing people, Saudi Arabia is hiring, and they're hiring executioners, and they're hiring amputators, right? and better pay than Nebraska. And so the, the United States government has no interest in opposing beheadings, or burnings, or burnings with missiles. Right? What Saudi Arabia is doing with US missiles in Yemen is no more moral than what it does to people on its streets with its swords, right? It's killing. It's unjustifiable murder with one weapon or another. And U.S. foreign policy has absolutely no interest uh, in discouraging murder or encouraging human rights, uh, unless perhaps your country has not been donating to the Clinton Foundation. Uh, <laughs> The, the, I mean, the, the question that frames this panel, how is the United States working to uh, confront and uh, end the you know, ISIS disaster, it isn't. It isn't. It is consciously working to expand it. Uh, the United States created the situation that allowed ISIS to arise, knowingly exacerbated that situation with the arms and the training and so forth into Syria. Uh, this young woman uh, who told Jeb that his brother created ISIS had more knowledge and understanding and decency than anyone who works for any television network in this country. And this pretense of asking these Republican candidates, if you knew now, if you knew then, what you know now, they did. We all did. It was known. It was glaringly obvious. These were lies that took people. In, and, you know, this is based on the lie that a country having weapons somehow justifies going in and destroying it for decades to come is based on the lie that you know Hillary wasn't out there advocating for it and voting for it. Uh, it it's it's all a deception. And and then there's this gross misunderstanding that somehow the lies ended when Bush left office, and that the lies about Benghazi that created the disaster in Libya that Bill was talking about, the lies about the chemical weapons in Syria, the lies about the stranded people on the mountaintop, the lies about the Khorasan group that didn't exist, the lies about Russian uh, invasions and airplanes shot down in Ukraine. At the end was endless lies have never let up. They are the same. Uh, and so the, the United States is not engaged in making things better and does not intend to be. Uh, it is fueling resentment and its attacks uh, which are killing civilians by the hundreds directly with bombs uh, in Iraq and Syria are, are, are the biggest recruitment tool and were known to be and desired as the biggest recruitment tool outdoing the torture in Abu Ghraib and so forth now for anti-US activism and militarism. And in 2013, when they wanted to send missiles into Syria, which Seymour Hersh exposed as a massive bombing campaign, not a couple of missiles here, 
and both political parties wanted it, and the, the media wanted it, every television network wanted it, Wall Street had Raytheon stock at record heights, everyone knew it was about to happen, and Obama said, you must look at these videos of children dying and be in favor of them dying, or in favor of me bombing Syria and killing more of them, those are your two options. And we stopped that, and we stopped it with help from the past decade of peace activism that had Congress members running around saying, I don't want to be seen as the jerk who voted for another Iraq. I'm afraid to back this thing. They're so afraid to back wars now that they just let them happen right. with no vote yes or no. Yeah. Operation Inherent Resolve, and they don't have the inherent decency to even take a position on it. Uh, and we stopped it. But what happened when we stopped it? And, and the British stopped it, and the world stopped it, and people within the US government stopped it. They kept the weapons flowing and the CIA trainers flowing and waited for a better propaganda moment to get their war that they wanted. They didn't do what needed to be done. And what needed to be done was a radical change in US policy from war to peace. If you, if you did that prison experiment with students where you make some of them the jailers and some of them the prisoners and waited for disaster to happen, but whenever the students were Muslim, you gave them automatic weapons. And then you came to the conclusion that Muslims are more violent. This would make as much sense as U.S. foreign policy when 80 to 90 percent of the weapons in the Middle East are made in the United States. You are arming a region of the globe and then creating chaos, creating desperation, fueling violence and anarchy, and then wondering why people are dying. So what do you do first? You stop making it worse. You, I mean, you, you declare an arms embargo, you demand ceasefires, and the arms embargo is three quarters of the way successful just by the United States alone, right? And if you can get these Sunni dictators and kings to join you in attacking Sunnis, you can get them to stop arming these people with weapons, which after all are coming from the United States in the first place in huge quantities. So you, you start a policy of disarmament. It, the weapons of mass destruction free Middle East was killed at the United Nations last week by the United States on behalf of Israel, right? That is not the policy of a government that's worried about decreasing violence in the Middle East. Uh, you send in actual aid for the amount of money that the United States spends on militarism, right? Just go back, Bernie Sanders was recently asked, I, I accused, of once advocating a 50% cut in U.S. military spending, and of course swore he had never said any <laughs> such Tommy Pinko nonsense. His answer should have been, my God, that would just get us back to 2001 levels, right? And if you got back to 2001 levels and you had two or three hundred billion dollars and you didn't know what to do with it, tens of billions would end starvation and hunger worldwide, would end unclean drinking water worldwide. You, 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 23 billion is U.S. foreign aid. Double it, triple it, quadruple it, put it into use, put, uh, you know, even Sanders says 70 billion would make education free in this country through college, like other countries do that don't bomb everywhere. Uh, you, could, you could have trains in New York City that get you someplace the same day you get on them. You could have high speed <laughs> rail, you could have solar, you could have wind, you could have, you could have a different world. You could save the physical planet uh, with a fraction of what's spent on making it worse through militarism. So that the idea of world beyond war uh, and of this book that we've produced that I have two copies left for sale because we had a panel a minute ago, uh, it, it is to create structures of nonviolence, of peace, of legal, economic, social structures that don't, like the United States is unique in doing in the world, look at a problem and say, how can we make it worse with bombing or should we do nothing? As if those are the two choices, right? Because every single war thus far has made things worse and we keep thinking the next one's gonna be the one that gets lucky. Militarism makes us less safe. There is not an upside. Uh, go to warisacrime.org slash less safe and read all the just retired generals and top officials and directors of national intelligence who admit that everything they're doing is counterproductive who are knowingly making us less safe, not more safe. It is our number one destroyer of the environment, the, the creation of the weapons, the testing and their use. The, it is the number one eroder of our civil liberties, even when the wars are for freedom. We, we lose our freedoms. 
it, it militarizes our police forces, it erodes our economy, it impoverishes us, it does not enrich us, it does not create jobs, it, it destroys our morality, it makes murder acceptable in ways that so many other things are just beyond the pale. And it kills more people by how the money is not spent than by how it is. You could save so many lives which what, with what is dumped into to militarism. So there never was, in Vietnam or anywhere else, a good side to cheer for in a war. There never will be. Nonviolent approaches to tyranny and oppression are much more likely to succeed, and those successes, on average, last over twice as long. So it, the, the, the resort, when push comes to shove, needs to be to the strongest weapons we have, and they are not weapons of violence. Um, we need, to, we need to sort of get beyond the idea that we're going to fix war, that we're going to make it legal, that we're going to have a new weapon that's going to make it better and be so awful or so easy to use that war is going to end, which is what was thought of everything from the machine gun up through now the drone. Uh, we need to get to the understanding that war is going to kill us all unless the, the, the stuff underground that it's fought for kills us all first. Uh, and if we're going to have the resources to address the real dangers that actually threaten us, that should have us running scared like idiots rather than, you know, the, 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 the beheader videos, we're going to need the resources that are now being wasted uh, on warfare. We, we, have, we have to make that switch. From, we have this endless debate in this country around 45% of, of federal spending that's not war. And liberals want more of it. And, Conservatives want less of it, and both are in absolute agreement on pretending that the other 55% uh, of the spending that Congress decides on doesn't exist and shouldn't be mentioned. Uh, but unless we start talking about, that, that is military spending, unless we start talking about moving money from horrible things to good things, uh, we're going to be in trouble and things are going to go from bad to worse. Thanks for having us here. both between the panelists and with all of you. I just want to set the stage for a moment. We did an earlier iteration of this panel that was really um, very interesting and successful right on the eve of the 20th anniversary of the U.S. Um, shock and awe invasion of Iraq in March. And here's why we needed to get into these questions. Ten years ago, on the second anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, for instance, we were still having huge protests under the Bush years. Obama comes in, the war's over, the war's over, and yet the targeted killings and the drone wars and the wars of intervention have spread all over the Middle East. It's actually more extensive under Obama. People are, are vaguely aware of that. But then you start talking about an anti-war protest, and people of all ages say to us, well, and I'm just using ISIS because they are the one that was in the news, but there are other groups. We have to do something about ISIS, is what comes back to you. US troops, US forces, drones, all of this need to be in the Middle East to hold control, and I, I guess, all of our speakers have spoken to this in different ways, but it is such an essential question to wrangle with um, among students of all ages, among people who should know, among people who live through Vietnam, who have lived through every other U.S. intervention in the last 60 years. There's no right on the side of the U.S., and yet it's complicated. So. I think we should let it rip. I know people have comments, thinking. I'd like to see a show of hands of who wants to talk, and we'll put together an order. OK, so I've got four to start with. We'll go across the room, red shirt. OK, I have a comment. It isn't really a question. I have a daughter that graduated from Fort and Lincoln Center, a couple of blocks from here. And her her there shows a pair of Muslim guy. Super guy. Um, they went on to have two children, eight years old and four years old, who I love dearly. 
but I don't let them call me grandpa. They call me Jadu, and they're my Athletas, which is grandfather and granddaughter. And I'll be out there in five, day, five days in Alaska. My daughter gave up her chance for corporate law. She graduated in the top 10% of her class at Fordham and law school. And she gave that up and is a public defender out there. And today you see that more and more where young people follow their conscience. And I hope that's a, a, a trend that continues. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right here, is that you? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question for uh, Bill. Uh, I'm actually halfway through a book called National Security and Double Government by Michael Glennon, who talks about uh, this whole network, which is called the National Security State, which is uh, apparently not subject to judicial, executive, or uh, legislative constraints, and which is really just sort of a, a it looks like a growing mechanism that that makes well it's it's not a shadow because it's actually quite public it's just that most of us don't realize how much decision making on that level of military apparatus and decisions about uh, things that Obama couldn't stop for instance even torture and so on that so many of those decisions are being influenced by this other apparatus which is called the national security state so I just wondered what you think of that. It, he makes a very compelling case. Uh, I also want to make put a plug in for uh, a workshop this afternoon at 3.15 that I'm a part of called Foreign Policy for All, Rethinking U.S. Foreign Policy for the 21st Century. That's going to be at 1.83, where we will cover a little bit about the national security state and other things. But I wondered what you think about that. Well, I think what our executives of government and the corporation do openly and knowingly, or at least it's been it's reported on a, a regular basis, that stuff is so bad that we don't even need the, the secret stuff, which you were talking about, to make it, to make it something evil. Uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't be aware of the other stuff and fight against it, but we don't need that to happen anyway. The enemy is, is very much in the open. Uh, you just take what our senators and congressmen say openly, and what they vote for openly, and the wars they, they push openly. That's all bad enough. And so I'm, I'm more concerned about that aspect of it than I am about any shadow government, or whatever you want to call it. Well, I wouldn't mind speaking to the first question. Um, I, I, I have heard countless stories about how, how the trend is the exact opposite. That is, that young people are getting out of school so burdened by debt, so tens of thousands of dollars in debt, that they are so constrained in their choices that they aren't able to do what they think will make the world a better place. They have to do what they think will, will pay their bills to the bank. Uh, and, uh, and, and while at the same, and I and I have no idea based on those anecdotes or yours. Uh, I would love to see an, a serious study of whether young people are more, which would be wonderful, or less, which would be disastrous, going by their conscience and doing good rather than uh, being herded into what their televisions have taught them to and their debts constrain them to, um, because uh, there are. There is $1.3 trillion now in total accumulated uh, student debt, which is annual military spending by the United States, $1.3 trillion. And so when people tell me that there's no way, there's no possible way to explain to young people that militarism affects them because there isn't a draft, we must have a draft if you're ever going to explain to young people that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, if you're a young person and you're too dumb to grasp the connection between $1.3 trillion every year into militarism and $1.3 trillion is the total accumulated disaster of student debt for everyone over past decades, uh, then, you know, I, I mean, it's a problem with elementary school at that point. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, personally, okay, I have a daughter in Alaska that's a public defender. She's actually has an intern now, or her agency does, where this girl graduated from Harvard, and to the chagrin of her parents, she has chosen the path of being becoming a public defender. Last year, she had a big case, and her co-counsel graduated from Columbia University. And, and I don't know exactly what her situation was at home, but those are two people that have graduated Ivy League schools and have chosen a path of being a public defender, as well as my brother who graduated from Florida. That, to me, is not a train maybe. I don't see it down in Ocean County. I live in Ocean County, New Jersey. And I agree, there's a big lapse in, in like young people being involved. But when I come up here and when I talk to my daughter, I see a trend of young people saying, I'm going to follow my conscience. And to me, it's, it's heartwarming. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. 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 Well, I just think that, you know, I would not put, you know, peaceful U.S. aid in, in a different category than the main way the U.S. enforces its interests around the world uh, through violence. For example, U.S. food aid, and I feel like I'm putting everything I'm saying about the United States in air quotes because it's not fundamentally aid. U.S. food aid has ruined the economies of countless and the agricultural base of countless third world countries. Dumping U.S. agribusiness products, wiping indigenous agriculture out of business. I mean, I was stunned, you know, among other things in Egypt, that, you know, everyone's just eating stuff made with American wheat. This is a country that can grow food, but their economy's been warped into growing cotton. Similarly, another eye-opener for me when I was in Egypt as part of the East Council of Freedom March was how insidious U.S. the oper operation, how insidiously U.S. imperialism operates through NGOs, including meeting many NGO activists who got into their work, you know, setting up schools for women and so on from very good motives, as I think many of this generation do have, but they got warped into things where, for example, when it was time for Sisi in Egypt to pull his coup, which we're learning more and more was orchestrated by the United States, these NGOs and these movements that have been, you know, this is part of the State Department's, I think they call it SAW, you know, they, they have their military intervention and they have their ideological work, they have their economic domination, and it is a package that from my perspective, needs to be opposed in total. Well, I'm sorry if I somehow gave an impression I disagreed with that, um, but it's interesting that I was on a panel very recently with the head of Ron Paul's Libertarian Peace Institute, uh, who gave me a very similar uh, speaking to to what I just heard from the communist side. There is, a, there is apparently some overlap because the Libertarian told me the United States should not give good, useful aid that people want and can benefit from because the aid that it currently gives is as just described. Uh, and now maybe the communist position is the U.S. should not give people good, useful aid they can actually use because it would be coming from the U.S. Uh, so there may be a joining of forces there, but my position is that the United States should radically halt just about everything it is doing and begin a different, respectful, democratic, and actually useful and actually humanitarian approach to the world. And maybe the communist position would be in order for that dream to happen, you need a revolution. Just throwing it out. Oh, I agree with Go that ahead. one, too. Um,